It's Friday, so of course it is Brunch with Bernie, our national town hall meeting with the guy I think of as America's senator. Uh, Vermonters know that he is theirs, but he shares himself with us every Friday, and it's just great to have a national town hall meeting with a with the United States Senator who will take your calls on, on pretty much any topic it is. Senator Sanders, welcome to the program. Great to be with you, Tom. And, and, and it's always so great to have you. Um, it, what's what's going on in, in the Senate right now? What's at the top of your to-do list? And well, uh, to be I, I tell you about what, those? I am... Uh... I'm on five committees, and one of the committees I'm on is the Budget Committee. And as I think listeners can guess, the Budget Committee has been working overtime lately. In fact, I think we have about five separate meetings uh, this week. Uh, as an independent, I caucus with the Democrats. I've been meeting with the Democrats who are majority on the caucus com- on the uh, Budget Committee. And let me take a minute to tell you about what we're trying to work on and what's going on, because I think you know fiscal cliffs and continuing resolutions and uh, all types of uh, other fiscal issues can sometimes get a little bit crazy out there. So let me just try to touch upon where we are at. Um, The president and I think most people recognize that the deficit is a serious situation. The deficit, by the way, has gone down. We're at about $850 billion this year. It's a lot. It's less than it used to be. Our national debt accumulation of deficits is over $16 trillion, a lot of money. First point to be made when we talk about the deficit is how we got into the deficit. Now, that I think many listeners know that has everything in the world to do with Bush taking us into two wars and not paying for it, huge tax breaks for the wealthiest people in this country, and most importantly, I think the Wall Street-caused recession which resulted in massive unemployment. When people are unemployed, they're not paying their federal taxes. Businesses are are going under. And uh, the end result of all of that, and this is a point, Tom, that is not made often enough. One of the major causes of the deficit right now is that revenue, the amount of money coming into the federal government as a percentage of the economy, the gross domestic product, is at 15.8%. That is the lowest that it has been in 60 years. So when people like Mitch McConnell and other Republicans say, well, the only thing we can do to deal with the deficit is to cut Social Security, cut Medicare, cut Medicaid, cut, 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 they're wrong. Because the amount of revenue coming in is at the lowest point that has been as a percentage of GDP in 60 years. So we have to make sure that we're not spending more than we should but we also have to increase the amount of revenue that we bring in. And what the Republicans have been saying is, as I think you know, people have heard John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and other Republican leaders say, no more revenue. We don't want any more. And they say that at a time when the wealthiest people in this country are doing phenomenally well. Let me give you one statistic, which I think should just knock the socks off of everybody who's listening. Recent study came out looking at income uh, from 2009 to 2011. That's the last statistics that we have seen. Over 100% of all of the new income generated, Tom, went to the top 1%. Over 1%. Over over 100% means that somebody lost. The bottom 99% saw a decline in their income. Right. So... All of, when people talk about economic growth and everything else, what they should understand, all of the new income generated in America went to the top 1%. Meanwhile, what we are looking at is real unemployment. There were some unemployment statistics today, which were good. A couple of hundred thousand jobs being created. That is good. But the fact is, real unemployment is not the 7.7% the papers are screaming about today. Real unemployment is over 14% if you include those people who have given up looking for work and people who are working part-time when they want to work, when they want to work full-time. Millions of people are out there who are working. They're working 20 hours a week. They want to work full-time. You have employers now who have cut back on work hours. They don't work, employ people 40 hours a week because they have to pay benefits. They do 30 hours a week. You add all of that together you are at over 14%. Those numbers are higher for young people. They're higher for people of color. All right. So what you have is wealthiest people doing phenomenally well. 
If you look at the stock market, you look at corporate profits, corporate profits are also, in many cases, at record-breaking levels. Corporations are doing phenomenally well. And here is the kicker. The effective tax rate that corporations are paying today is about 12% of profits, which is the lowest that it has been since 1972. You have one out of four major corporations in America paying nothing in taxes. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. In 2010, Bank of America set up more than 200 subsidiaries in the Cayman Islands. They did that not because they liked the climate in the Cayman Islands, which is no doubt very sunny and nice, but it's how you avoid paying U.S. taxes, and it worked. So in 2010, not only did the Bank of America not pay anything, not pay a nickel in federal income taxes, it received a rebate from the IRS worth $1.9 billion that year. Citigroup, you know, one of the large financial institutions in this country, uh, a group that we bailed out when their greed and recklessness brought them uh, to the edge of bankruptcy. Uh, Citigroup has paid no federal income taxes for the last four years after establishing 25 subsidiaries in offshore tax havens and receiving more than $2.5 trillion in total financial assistance from the Fed and, and the Treasury as part of the bailout. So they received huge amounts of money in bailouts. They now have 25 subsidiaries offshore, paid no federal income taxes for the last four, year, four years. 2009, ExxonMobil, which has historically been one of the most profitable corporations in the world, ExxonMobil made $19 billion in profits, and in 2009, not only did Exxon avoid paying federal income taxes that year, they actually received a $156 million rebate from the IRS, on and on and on and on. So you've got the energy companies, you've got Wall Street, uh, either paying nothing or very, very little in federal taxes. So the debate that we're having right now is a pretty simple one. you got the Republicans saying that, oh, yeah, well, all of these corporations are paying nothing in taxes. Some of them are getting rebates. So that's fine. The real way to do deficit reduction is to cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, education, nutrition, infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What some of us are saying, progressives are saying, excuse me, uh, we have already seen massive cuts as part of deficit reduction, uh, well over a trillion dollars. And now we do have to ask the wealthy and large corporations to help us with deficit reduction. That's the big debate. Unfortunately, on this issue, uh, the president has not been playing a particularly good role of late. Uh, as you know, he is out uh, with dinner and for lunch with a bunch of Republicans. And what they are talking about, by the way, is sometime, some type of what they call a grand bargain, which would almost definitely include cuts in Social Security uh, and uh, cuts in benefits for disabled veterans. And that is something, as chairman of the Veterans Committee, uh, that I will very, very strongly oppose. So what the debate about deficit reduction is, is number one, how do you do it in a way that's fair? Number two, to make sure that we do not forget that while deficit reduction is a serious issue, and we are making some progress there, what's a more serious issue is creating the millions of jobs that working families need and jobs that pay a living wage. We have a jobs crisis, not a budget crisis. Um, Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour. Senator Sanders take, taking your calls up next here on our National Town Hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie. Check out Bernie's website, sanders.senate.com. Gov for his newsletter and all the news of the day. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And one of our callers today is going to receive a free signed copy of my book, Cracking the Code, Political Communications, uh, sent to you by Stamps.com. And welcome back. Liz, watching us on Free Speech TV. Liz, you are on the air with Senator Sanders. Good morning, Senator. Um, I, j- I just heard what you were speaking about, uh, uh, the cutting of possibly of Social Security. But this more, I have a question. Now that corporations are people, 
shouldn't they be paying Social Security on on all their income? And I'm talking about their gross income, and they can't write it off as a business expense, so they get a further deduction for their, um, um, you know, on their taxes. Well, is that's a good question, uh, but I don't accept that corporations are people. Uh, and that is one of the reasons we're going to reintroduce a constitutional amendment uh, legislation uh, to overturn Citizens United. As I think most listeners know, the Supreme Court two and a half years ago or so came up with a totally preposterous five to four decision which said, as Liz indicated, that corporations are people. Uh, and as a result, they could contribute as much as they want into political campaigns. The result of that has been some families out there, billionaire families, are contributing hundreds of millions of dollars into the political process, supporting uh, right-wing uh, extremists and uh, creating, I think, a real question mark on the nature of our democracy. So, uh, Liz, I'm gonna, I don't accept uh, that corporations are people. Uh, we're going to fight and, uh, to make sure that Social Security is solvent uh, for the next uh, 50 to 75 years. Uh, just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, Congressman Pete Tavazio of Oregon and myself introduced legislation that would do just that by lifting the cap on taxable income uh, starting at uh, $250,000. So uh, we're working hard on making sure that Social Security will be there for our kids and grandchildren without cuts to benefits. Archie in Yucca Valley, California, watching us on Free Speech TV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Senator Sanders. I heard a little blip when when you're all in the negotiation for nailing down the taxes that you were asking for at least a 30% minimum on anybody that makes more than $5 million. Will you explain to me how these people can, and I'm only talking about the $5 million, how they can write off $440,000 a year, please? Well, you know, when you're worth that much money, you're able to... Uh hire uh, a whole lot of accountants and when you're able and, and you also have uh tax laws you know these guys are not out um, as carpenters and police officers earning income most of their income uh comes from stocks and bonds and and uh, dividends um, and the tax code today makes it very easy for them to shelter uh, a lot of this money and defer taxes on it. And uh, this is a tax code clearly written to benefit uh, wealthy individuals. And that gets you back to what you're talking about is the Buffett rule. And it was named after Warren Buffett, who was, I think, I don't know, first, second, third wealthiest per- person in this country with 40 or 50 billion or something like that. And what he made the point is that he, one of the richest people in this country, has an effective tax rate lower than his secretaries. His secretary. He gets the salary. Most of his money is made in uh, in, in dividends and, and stocks and bonds. Twenty minutes past the hour, we'll be back with more of Bernie, Senator Bernie Sanders, and your questions here on our national town hall meeting. Brunch with Bernie right after this. Welcome back to the place where smart people get their news, the Tom Harbin program, and Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour, taking your questions, and Tom in San Francisco. Tom, you are on the air with Senator Sanders. So they told me to phrase this in the idea of a question, and you've sort of answered it a bit already, but I was wondering if it would be possible to raise the cap, the FICA, uh, you know, income tax cap, up to five hundred thousand dollars, but at the same time, then reduce the FICA tax rate itself yep. by twenty five percent. You know, by twenty five percent lower you know, than what it is. Because I want to see Republicans go on the floor and argue against a tax cut. <laughs> Tom, you make a good point. I mean, there are a variety. What Tom is saying. So let's be clear. Right now, we have a kind of a flat tax uh, on of FICA Social Security. Tax at six point two percent. Employers pay six point two percent. So if you make one hundred and thirteen thousand, you're paying six point two. You make fifty thousand, you're paying six point two. 
interestingly, and I think this is the point that Tom is getting, right now the cap is at 113000 Somebody makes a million, somebody makes 113000 They are both paying the same uh, amount into the system. If you lift the cap, and what uh, Congressman DeFazio and I did is it, we didn't start at 114000 We said, all right, wait a second. We're going to go all the way up to 250000 so somebody making uh, 249000 uh is not going to pay any more than he does today. But once you're earning more than $250,000, that cap is lifted, and you are going to pay uh, based on your total uh, income. If you do that, uh, you will bring in at least another 50 years of Social Security solvency. What Tom is suggesting, there's another way to do it is you could bring in more money and you can lower that 6.2% to 4% or whatever you want to do it. You can do it that way. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we kept it the way it is now, just lifting the cap with the goal of making sure that Social Security would be solvent for the next 50 years. Wendy in White Lake, New York. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, I have a brief question about the important climate change legislation that you and Senator Boxer introduced. Um, first, could you amend the definition of carbon polluting substance um, to include the extraction process of natural gas, even if it's going to be exported, because this is precisely the phase during which um, much of the methane that contributes like 25 right. to 33 times more climate to climate change? Well, Wendy, you're right to be concerned about methane. What we did, again, uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we imposed a, uh, Senator Boxer and I imposed a carbon tax on approximately the largest 3,000, uh, polluters in the country, people who are emitting the most carbon emission. So it applies to anybody, uh, who is, uh, one of the largest 3,000 emitters, which would account for about 85% of the carbon emission. So rather than imposing a tax on thousands and thousands and tens and tens and tens of thousands, of entities, uh, we figured what would be the best way to go, the simplest way to go, is to go after the very biggest. It turns out to be about 3,000 who emit about 85% of the emissions, no matter how those emissions are created. So certainly the answer to your question is yes, if they're one of the uh, top 3,000 who uh, constitute about 85% of the emissions. But the bottom line here uh, let me just say a word on that as a member of both the environmental and the energy uh, committees. Uh, I hope everybody understands that uh, climate change is real. It is already causing devastating problems to our planet. Uh, what the leading scientists who study this issue tell us that if we don't get our act together, the temperature of this planet could rise by 7, 8, 9 degrees by the end of the century. That would mean major cities in the United States of America underwater all over the world, coastal cities underwater, severe drought, extreme weather disturbances. I mean, real chaos for this planet. And one of the issues that bothers me the most is that despite the dire, dire projections of the leading scientists all over the world, we have a Congress that refuses to even acknowledge in a serious way the problem, let alone address it. So, Wendy, this is an issue we're going to continue to work on. Rusty in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, how you doing? Good. Good. I had a question about uh, the government funding fire, EMS, and police. It seems that the crime rate's been up very, very high. And, uh, oh, God damn it, I just... Oh, wait, pardon, pardon. We, we're going to drop that. And my apologies to any, any of our station. I think that we caught that guy's obscenity, but... Uh... My apologies to anybody who might have caught it. Chris in Fairfax, California. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, Senator Sanders, I'd like to know whether you would filibuster any uh, cuts or damages to the Social Security program. Well, Chris, I'm leading, you know, I, you can't do a filibuster every day. Uh, I am chairman of the Defending Social Security Caucus. I've been leading that effort, and I will continue the effort, to lead the effort. So the kind of tactics we will use uh, as we proceed down the pike is, is something that we're thinking about. Certainly a filibuster is one of the options that's available. Uh, and I want to point out something, though, in terms of the so-called chain CPI, because I want everybody to know what, what it means when we talk about cutting Social Security. What we are talking about is 
the mechanism that they're going to use, and as I said earlier, it's not just Republicans who are talking about it. This is exactly what Obamas are talking about. Is they say, here's their argument. They say, you know, the way we calculate uh, cost of living increases for disabled vets and people on disability and older people on Social Security, it has been too generous, too generous, and we have to cut back on that, make it skimpier. The result of that, and I disagree with that assertion. I think if you talk to most seniors, what they will tell you is that they spend a lot of money, by definition, on health care, on prescription drugs, and on keeping warm in the winter, and on food. And those costs, in fact, have gone up by and large more than general inflation, not less. Uh, Tom, I guess we'll continue this discussion in a moment. We certainly will. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour here on the Tom Hartman Program. 28 minutes past the hour. Check out Bernie's website, sanders.senate.gov. You can sign up for the Bernie Buzz, a free newsletter. It's a lot of great information in there. And also, every day, the, the, the website is updated with the latest news. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. Back with more of your calls and questions for Bernie right after this. 28 minutes past the hour. Bernie, our Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls. And Corky in Hilton, New York. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello. Hello, Senator Sanders. Hi. I would like to know when you're going to reintroduce that bill on outsourcing and cutting off the tax breaks. Now, if you, if you would please do a favor for me. I commend uh, President Obama for trying to raise the minimum wage to $9 an hour. But in a single-income family, that's only $360 a week. Could you please walk that over to Paul Ryan and ask him to budget a family of four, single-income, on three hundred and sixty dollars a week, that's housing, gas, insurance, retirement, all the necessities it takes to live in a family. Could you please walk that over to him and tell me how you live on that? Well, Corky, thank you very much for your two-part question, and, and I think your your point about minimum wage is exactly right. Uh, I will support raising the minimum wage. Uh, I would like it to go higher than nine dollars an hour, but that's a start. But your point is, even if we do have it at nine dollars an hour, it's three hundred and sixty uh, dollars uh, a week. Uh, and that's less than twenty thousand uh, dollars a year, um, and people can't live on that, especially if you have kids. But I should tell you uh, that whether I walk it over to Ryan or not, uh, we're going to have very little or virtually uh, no support from Republicans on raising the minimum wage. Uh, and we're just going to have to develop the kind of grass movement which gives them an offer they can't refuse. I think we can raise the minimum wage, uh, but at this point, I'm not sure that we have Republican support. Your second point about doing away with these uh, tax breaks that companies who put their money into the Cayman Islands and, and, and other tax havens receive, we've already introduced that bill. Uh, and that bill would bring in a huge amount of money, over $500 billion a year. Uh, right now, we are seeing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, many, many corporations on Wall Street uh, and, around, and in other sectors uh, stashing their money in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, uh, and other tax havens where they're paying zero uh, taxes, and they're able to avoid paying taxes to the United States of America. You know, and I get particularly upset uh, that many of these Wall Street companies Wall Street to financial institutions that were bailed out by the American people. Uh, they were just very proud to be American when they were being bailed out by the middle class of this country because of their greed and recklessness. Uh, but when it comes to paying taxes, they don't want, they don't consider themselves American. I guess they're Cayman Islanders. Uh, so my thought is the next time they go broke, let the Cayman Islands bail them out, not the American taxpayer. But be that as it may, we have reintroduced that bill. It's, I think, an intelligent bill which will not only bring in revenue, create tax fairness in the, in the United States, but also help us create jobs. So that's where we are on that one. Okay, Bob in Clifton, Tennessee. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. I live in a rural area where FedEx and UPS drop off parcels at the post office for end-of-the-line delivery. Correct. I would like to know 
if they pay full price uh, for that delivery, and if not, why not? Uh, Bob, that's a great question, and I can't, I don't have the information in front of me uh, to give you. They work out a contract with the Postal Service, and Bob's point is that uh, all over America, rural areas, uh, it is the United States Postal Service which actually brings uh, the package to people's homes. Uh, but I will tell you, Bob, uh, that we are very, very concerned about uh, some of the ideas coming from the Inspector General uh, regarding, uh, not the Inspector General, but the, uh, the Postmaster General regarding um, the future of the post office. And we've been engaged in this issue for the last several years. Their latest idea is to eliminate Saturday uh, mail delivery uh, for first-class mail, which we think is a bad idea. Previously, they had talked about cutting down about half of the uh, mail uh, distribution centers in the country and about half of the rural post offices in America, some 15,000 of them, shutting them down. Uh, we have fought back successfully, uh, and while some changes are taking place, hours in rural post offices have been reduced. They haven't been shut down. So we're making some progress in preventing the kind of draconian cuts that some people are talking about. That fight is going to resurface very, very soon. I've introduced legislation in the Senate, which I think has about 10 co-sponsors, which would strengthen the post office. And the major problem, Bob, Postal Service has is that right now about 80% of their financial problems has to do with uh, a, an onerous burden on the post office calling for um, uh, something like $5 billion a year payments for uh, health care, uh, for future health care retiree benefits. And no other entity in the government, no other entity in the private sector has to do that. So we are working very, very hard uh, to save the postal service, to give them new options to raise revenue so they continue to do the work they are all over America. Reginald in Houston, Texas, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hey, yes, how you guys doing? Yes, I want to, you know, on filibuster and uh the Rand Paul he stood up against you know for against the uh, the nomination there of the CIA director had issue with the drones the one with uh killing some valors in the NDAA. And I think that should have been a maybe a bipartisan thing to stand up against. In my opinion that was a a, a balance uh a real uh balanced thing that he did. And sometimes, you know, when you speak out against the United States they call you non patriotic. They did that with Dr. King when he spoke up against the war. And speaking on that, when Chavez in his death, when he spoke out against some wars or some things that, you know, we do here in America says uh, uh says like when uh, we uh t- we did the wars and we we have power well, you know, we exempl- we uh, explored our power and uh and Reginald, is there a question in there for Bernie? The, the, the question is how did he feel about the filibustering, and also what did he think about Chavez's uh, death uh, in that regard okay. as far as... Uh, Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Reginald. I think I got the questions. Well, uh, you know, I respect anybody. You know, Rand Paul and I have very, very different points of view. Uh, Rand Paul, I, I think we consider things like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid unconstitutional. They impose drastic cuts. We just talked about the Postal Service. My guess is he would wipe out the Postal Service. Uh, tomorrow, he would protect and defend tax breaks for very wealthy individuals. So his views and mine on many, many issues are completely uh, in opposite, in opposition to each other. Um, I respect somebody who's going to go to the floor for 12 hours and speak. I ended up voting against uh, Mr. Brennan, uh, not because, as, as Senator Paul suggested, that he thought the United States and Barack Obama would be uh, sending drones into a cafe in San Francisco to blow people up. I think that's totally absurd, I mean, and, and really dangerous rhetoric, uh, but because I continue to believe, as I have for many years, uh, that our intelligence agencies uh, are not respectful enough of, of civil liberties. Uh, the United States is facing some very uh, dangerous uh, enemies who want to do us harm, and we have to be vigilant in, in defeating them and arresting them and killing them when necessary. But at the same time, I believe that as we engage in that struggle, we can protect the constitutional rights of the American people. And I'm not sure that our intelligence agencies uh, or Mr. Brennan have been as cognizant of that as they should. Noah in Madison, Wisconsin. Hello? You're on the air with Senator Sanders, Noah. Noah? Hello? Noah? Noah is not there. 
Merlene in Morriston, Florida. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Merlene? Do we have a problem, Houston? Bernie, you're still there, right? I'm here. Okay, well, that's a good sign. Uh, let's try Johnny in Vacaville, California. Johnny, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can okay, you hear me? you're on the air. Yeah, go for it. Oh, great. Hi, Senator Sanders. Hi, Johnny. Nice to talk to you both today. Uh, the reason I called, my question has to do with another tax loophole that's been uh, used by Facebook, I know, in the past year and probably many other companies. It's a stock hole where they issue uh, their uh, employees' stock as income rather than paying them salaries. And that allows the company to, de- to deduct that from their income tax, so they pay no income tax on that money. And, there's, and their employees pay no income tax on the money. Huh. So the employees escape paying income tax, and the employer, that is, in this case, the example being Facebook, uh, avoids paying taxes because of the stock issuance loophole. I'm wondering if that's in your bill. Well, the, that is not in the bill that um, that I've just discussed. That, that, the bill that I have discussed uh, talks uh, about uh, ends um, uh, tax havens in the Cayman Islands and elsewhere by which people are parking huge amounts of money and avoiding paying U.S. Uh, taxes. Uh, what you're talking about, Johnny, is something, frankly, I'm not familiar with, but what I do know is there are a zillion ways out there that smart accountants and can avoid paying, uh, uh, having their companies avoid paying taxes, and we have all kinds of lobbyists out there working night and day to create the loopholes that will enable these lobby these accountants to avoid paying taxes. So thank you for that, but it's one of many, and, and that speaks to the need to simplify uh, the tax system, do away with these loopholes, and make sure that we have a progressive tax system in which the wealthiest people in this country uh, stop paying their fair share. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're just we're just ten seconds from the break here, Bernie. I, you, the uh, uh, totally in agreement, and 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 maybe even changing the Mitt Romney loophole, the capital gains loophole. Absolutely. I mean, that's just an example. Somebody asked me earlier why it is that you know working people pay higher tax rates. Uh, than wealthy, and that's, again, the capital gains loophole uh, is certainly uh, one of those reasons. Right. Go. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. Our national town hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie. It's 45 minutes past the hour. We'll be back with more of your calls for Senator Sanders right after this. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video Welcome back. Merlene in Morriston, Florida, watching us on Free Speech TV. We'll try it again. Can you hear us now? Yes, I can. Okay, great. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. All right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Senator Sanders, uh, you know, uh, Social Security, you're on the Budget Committee. Social Security should be removed from from the uh, budget. It is not a budget item. President Johnson put it in there to make the Vietnam War look better. Well, Social Security, uh, you're right. Social Security, and this is a very important point. Marlene is exactly correct. Uh, when people tell you that Social Security uh, has a deficit, it, it is, is part of the deficit problem in this country, uh, they're not telling you the truth for two reasons. Number one, Social Security is a $2.7 trillion surplus and can pay out every benefit for the next 20 years. But as Marlene indicates, Social Security is not funded by the general treasury. It is funded by the payroll tax, by FICA, which is an independent, uh, distinct form, flow of revenue. Uh, and, um, and, and she's right. And so that is why we are fighting very hard uh, to prevent cuts from Social Security when, in fact, it hasn't contributed to the deficit and it has a surplus. Marlene is quite right. Okay, Marianne in Everett, Michigan. You're watching us on Free Speech TV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, Senator Sanders, I just wanted to know if there had been any um, follow-up or movement out of committees or whatever on the legislation, and I believe it was Peter Welch or Welsh from Vermont that was starting it about the indemnity clauses that a lot of these corporations and stuff have been getting attached to 
uh, decisions on, you know, uh, fraud cases and that sort of thing? Uh, being able to deduct as a business expense what they had to pay in indemnity? Is that what the, I think that's what well, the yeah, it was almost like there was a loop going on where the tax, pay, you know, they were still giving right. businesses to these corporations, and then we paid them taxpayer money, and they're using that to pay their fines. No, you're exactly it's right. Crazy. And, and uh, Congressman <laughs> Welch, is my colleague from Vermont, he does a, a fine job representing Vermont in the country, and that's a good piece of legislation. Uh, Marion, I can't give you a progress report on where that is right now. I'm sorry. I, I have not, uh, I'm, I'm not in the House, and I haven't followed that. David in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Just a minute to the break, David. A quick one for Bernie. Uh, yes, you wanted my question? Yes. Okay, my question is, um, uh, you know, I've worked a lot in trying to, um, and Occupy and so forth, and many things trying to um, get our voices heard. What can we do as ordinary citizens to actually get our voice out there and make sure that the Republicans do not um, cut our Social Security, our earned benefits, and Medicare and Medicaid? Well, two things. You have to understand that it's not just the Republicans are absolutely unanimous about wanting to cut Social Security and veterans' benefits. Uh, but it's not just the Republicans. The president is also sympathetic to the concept of the chain CPI, which would do that as well. I think what you do is a couple of things. I think you start flooding the White House uh, with um, uh, with response to say, do not cut Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or veterans' benefits. Also, invite your local uh, member of the House, uh, your senator, uh, to have a dialogue with you uh, about Social Security and other uh, important programs. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls right after this, 10 minutes before the hour. Welcome back. It's Brunch with Bernie. Our national town hall meeting with Senator Bernie Sanders answering your questions. Noah in Madison, Wisconsin. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Tom and Senator Sanders. It's good to be with you. Uh, So before I get to my question, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I have a fourth cousin. We share a great-great-great-grandfather, Nicholas Abler, together. And this cousin of mine is named Congressman Paul Ryan. I would like to get a message out to my cousin asking him to work with Democrats and Senator Sanders to uh, not cut Social Security to raise the cap on FICA taxes for Medicare and Social Security. But my question is, uh, Ben Bernanke once commented that in order to get quantitative easing to benefit federal, state, and local governments um, instead of just buying up toxic assets of, of uh commercial banks, then the Federal Reserve Act would have to be repealed or rewritten somehow. I wonder if um, Senator Sanders could comment on that. Well, uh, first point is, good luck with your cousin. I hope you can use your familiar ties uh, to urge him to do the right thing, but I I, I wouldn't uh, hold my breath about Thanksgiving dinner going well. Uh, Second point, in terms of the Fed, it is an issue that we are working on. Uh, It's a very tough issue uh, because uh, to make any significant reforms uh, would require taking on Wall Street. And Wall Street, uh, Noah, as I think you know, is just unbelievably powerful, Uh, pretty much own uh, the Republican Party and a significant part of the Democratic Party as well. Uh, We have tried to bring forth, we've done a couple of things. Probably up to now, the most successful thing that I did is part of uh, Dodd Frank, we got an audit of the Fed during the emergency bailout period, which told us extraordinary facts that we otherwise would not have known. That among other things, the Fed provided uh, zero interest or almost zero interest loans to the tune of $16 trillion on a revolving loan fund to every major financial institution in America and many uh, central banks all over the world. Uh, what we were working on now is something a lot more modest, which has also run into a tough opposition. And that is right now the regional banks, uh, many of the members uh, of the regional banks are appointed by the bankers themselves. And we had the absurd situation where in the New York Fed, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, 
was sitting on the Fed, supposedly regulating large financial Wall Street institutions, which seemed to me to be very much a question of the fox guarding the hen house. So we are working on Fed reform, but it, it's a tough issue because of the power of Wall Street. Uh, Jeff in Portland, Oregon. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thank you, Tom, for taking my call, and it's an honor to speak to you and Bernie. Um, I, I just wanted to say, um, first off, in regards to the filibuster, you know, Chris Hedges uh, has a lawsuit against the administration over provisions in, in the NDAA as relates to that filibuster. Um, and it'd be great to hear him talk about it on the show if you can get him on. But um, my, my main thing with the filibuster was I was disappointed um, that progressives didn't stand up uh, with him. I know um, my senator did, Ron Wyden, I want to thank him for doing that. And I know um, my other senator, Merkley, voted no on Brennan, as, as you did too, Bernie. Thank you for doing that. Um, but that leads me to my question. With the lack of progressives getting involved in, in a matter like that, um, and if President Obama cut Social Security, Medicaid, or Medicaid, uh, Medicare, or Medicaid, um, doesn't it signal almost the death of liberalism in the Democratic Party, and which actually, you know, did start with Clinton making uh, deals like NAFTA and deregulating the banks, and with uh, with only a quarter of the Progressive Caucus signing on to the Grayson to Cano letter. Are, are progressives really doing enough, Bernie, to uh, stop this slide um, with uh, President Obama getting ready to cut, to cut these uh, fundamental programs? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Sorry, Jeff. You know, that's kind of a mouthful that you've asked a, a you know, very important question, which would take more than a few minutes to, to really answer in a, an effective way. But uh, let me just, just say this. Um, what you have now politically in America is a very significant movement to the right in terms of both political parties. The Republican Party, which traditionally has been a center-right party, is now pretty much a right-wing extremist party. Uh, the Democratic Party, which has traditionally been a center-left party representing working people and so forth, has become pretty much a centrist party. I think the good things that the Democrats are doing is protecting uh, to a significant degree, women's rights. Uh, they have been very strong. Obama has been strong on issues like gay rights. We're making some progress in protecting the rights of, of Hispanics and others. Um, but on economic issues, um, you're seeing both parties, to a very significant degree, controlled by big money and not doing the right thing. Uh, and, um, you know, whether it is trade policy, which you mentioned, that's kind of bipartisan. Uh, whether it is the a willingness to take on Wall Street, remember that it was under Clinton. Bob Rubin then was the was the uh, Treasury Secretary. He worked with right wingers like Alan Greenspan to deregulate Wall Street, uh, which led us to uh, the situation where we're in right now, where uh, not only do we have to go through the horrendous financial collapse of Wall Street, uh, but now we're seeing a handful of banks only owning a significant part of the assets of America. That was kind of bipartisan as well. So I would say on economic issues, uh, Jeff, you're right. You have, uh, you know, you have some great people in the Democratic Party who are fighting for working people, but they are pretty much the minority. Uh, so there are differences between the parties, to be sure, on a number of important issues. Climate change. Republicans are literally living in denial. Democrats aren't, but Democrats are not doing enough to fight for the kinds of transformation of our energy system that we need. So, are progressives doing enough? Uh, I think you've got some people in the Progressive Caucus in the House who are doing a great job. And remember, they're fighting on, on, you asked why weren't they on the floor on drones? Well, you know, they're fighting a million fights. We're fighting against the cuts in Social Security. We're fighting in terms of making sure that every American has health care is a right. We're fighting on climate change. Uh, we're dealing with a whole lot of stuff, so people can't do everything every day. Uh, but there's no question that we need a revitalized grassroots movement, strong labor effort to move this country in a progressive way. And you're such an important part of that, Bernie. Thanks so much for being with us today.